Coming up today, stocks finish mixed, but put in the best quarter since 2019. GDP growth comes in better than expected. Sam Bankman Freed sentenced to 25 years in prison, cementing the wild fall of the two crypto kings. Short sellers coming after micro strategy and agricultural commodities on the march higher. And welcome back everybody to the world's largest casino we call the stock market. S&P 500 closed at an all-time high today, 52.54, and the parabolic grinding uptrend continues. Apart from semiconductors underneath their five-day moving average, we've got every other stock sector above all moving averages showing that there is quite a lot of bullish breadth and uptrends out there. And what's been interesting this week, we've been getting quite the bid in hard assets. Saw that again today. Leading sector gold miners, oil and gas, energy, and clean energy. Losing sectors, biotech, discretionary, and tech. There's a look at the rolling 12-month returns for the 11 major sectors. Communications and tech out front. Got utilities flat on the year. And other defensive sectors still lagging behind the growth stuff as well. But what's been catching up this year is energy and agricultural commodities and stock. I can see here at the start of this year, there's about a 20 percentage point gap between the S&P 500 and the blue line and agricultural commodities and energy stocks. They're rolling one year returns. However, that's closing in now as these two sectors, especially this month of March into the end of Q1, have accelerated. You can see that in the agricultural commodity fund DBA moving higher again. Going into a parabolic uptrend here on some pretty good momentum. And so even though the S&P 500 pretty much finished flat, NASDAQ finished down a little bit. Like I said, this was going to be a really low volatility, low volume week going into the long Easter weekend. That wasn't the story in the commodity space. We've got gold ripping up to all time highs here, getting above 2200 an ounce. We've got crude shaping up as well. I can see my trend strength indicator. It's just gone positive and blue, confirming this market is starting to trend now, but still has a little bit more work to do. We can see on the weekly chart here, it's got a bit of resistance around this $83 to $84 level where it's turned off a few times. If we can get above that, put in a higher high, then that's going to add more strength to this uptrend. And as we're just getting news that US farmers are expected to plant less corn this spring, that gave quite the bump up to this important commodity today, over 3.5% on heavy volume here. After that's been in a downtrend for a little while now, and that spilled over to its cousin wheat, trading up as well, and these markets may be potentially turning. And if they do, since they're really important agricultural commodities used in a lot of things, that's likely to exacerbate the uptrend in overall agricultural commodities, with things like cocoa, already one of the top performing assets this year. And this is not the type of thing you see in a commodity bear market, just like in a stock bull market, you see some stocks going crazy like this. And so my point is, this is all inflationary stuff. You could think of commodities as like leading inflation indicators, as they're the primary cost inputs into a lot of our goods and services, not to mention the cost of moving them around, shipping and cargo, being on an absolute tear this last six months as well. And there's a look at some of the hottest stocks in the market and how they perform today. Donald Trump stock, DJT, still very volatile, down 6.4% today. The new AI stock, Astera Labs, having a bit of a fall and quite the pullback in Reddit, down over 14% today, very volatile stock. It's only on Tuesday, we got up to almost $75 a share. Now we're back down below 50. And semiconductor shares continue to be a little soft, consolidating, having a bit of a pullback. There's Nvidia, still building this bearish divergence off this big sell candle. However, I'm not sure if that'll play out after their blockbuster AI conference conference has every fundamental reason to keep ripping higher. Although other important semiconductor stocks like AMD look a bit weaker, actually having lost its 50 day VWAP after we got this sell signal a couple of weeks ago on the 8th here. That proved to be right. However, I wouldn't call this in a downtrend just yet. Still too early to say whether the semiconductor trade is over or not. And just as a reminder, today's your last chance to get lifetime access to all the indicators you see on this chart here. I use every day in these videos, including my sector trends table indicator, all these indicators, sector analysis, all my fundamental indicators that you can use to analyze any stock from around the world, no matter where you are. In addition to my portfolio monitor indicator. If you're interested in getting lifetime access to my 25 custom indicators, then click the link below this video, head on over to my website, clickcapital.io and take advantage of this special offer for just a one-time payment of $239 today. Comes with a seven-day money-back guarantee, no ongoing costs and gets your future access to all indicators free of charge. And like I said, for most people, just one or two extra winning trades 
will cover the cost of that and you can upgrade your trading toolbox instead of using all the free basic ones that most people do. So this offer expires in two days and it's going to be quite a while before I do a deal on my indicators again. So if you're interested in them, click the link below this video and you're welcome to test them out for seven days with a money back guarantee in case you change your mind. And just getting back into the daily review, on top of that, we've still got the US economy holding up and performing really well. Fourth quarter GDP growth came in above expectations at 3.4%. That was revised upwards as the government previously said it expanded at 3.2%. On top of that, consumer spending, which accounts for 70% of the US economy, was also revised up to show a 3.3% increase in the fourth quarter instead of 3%. Businesses are also in good shape. Corporate profits surged in the fourth quarter at an annual 4.1% rate. We've also got a resilient jobs market as well. We saw that again today with jobless claims coming in better than expected. Unemployment rate still hovering around 4% near all-time lows. And even though we're seeing consumer confidence bouncing around, that's still holding in there. We saw consumer sentiment climb into a two and a half year high. So like this article on Barron says, no matter how you slice it, US economic growth remains robust. Everything is chugging along pretty good here. The problems in the regional banks and commercial real estate looks well contained. Consumers and businesses are holding up pretty good. And of course, we have risk assets ripping up to all time highs. And just as I've showed you with the price action in commodities, inflation risks appear to be tilting higher. We've already seen the last couple of CPI prints coming in a bit hotter than expected. Shine inflation has flatlined, if not already ticking back up higher. Yet the Fed and the market is still convinced they're going to cut rates three times this year. And we'll get another look at that tomorrow when the stock market is shut, with the Fed's preferred inflation gauge, personal consumption and expenditures. Coming on Good Friday, same time we'll hear from Jay Powell. Interested to see if he's still towing the dovish line there. If he is, he's got his work cut out to justify any rate cuts this summer. And in my opinion, he's slowly changing the Fed's language from 2% target to a 3% target. He just can't come out and say that all of a sudden, because that'll be too shocking. Instead, I think he'll kind of drag out that communication, possibly over six months, 12 months. But I already think he's discussed with other members behind closed doors that they're probably moving towards and going to be comfortable with a 3% target. That's why the bond market's a little confused. Let's get in this economic data. Yields want to go higher. Have the Fed still indicating it's going to cut? We can see that in the two-year yield. Trend strength's gone negative. Market is ranging. Same with the 10-year. Just tracking sideways here at 420. And even though yields have moved up, stock market hasn't cared much at all. That's normally what tips the stock market over, either increasing yields or increasing unemployment rate or an external surprise shock. They're the three biggest reasons, looking back in history, why a stock market will have a correction. How the stock market right now is very resilient. And so like this article says here, it may still go higher, even, even if we get some higher inflation prints and the Fed's just not able to cut rates as much as they want to. And thanks to Jay Powell and his mates, over the last 15 years, we've now got the biggest gap between the top 1% and everybody else. That's because inflation helps them more than the working poor because their assets get inflated, but the cost of living for a lot of working people has taken 30% more of their income over the last three years, even though their income hasn't moved up. And if Jay goes ahead and cuts rates, that's just gonna exacerbate that record wealth gap even further. But like JP Morgan correctly says here, we could be building up towards a cascading flash crash as a lot of people pack into the markets, becoming really concentrated, sediment and participation hitting highs, building a wide consensus that if one fund begins pulling out, it could trigger a broad market fallout. Not to mention one of the most infamous trades on Wall Street is roaring back and that is short volatility. And we can see that the huge amount of funds coming into option riding ETFs with the most famous being JEPI. That's the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF. Now got a whopping 33.5 billion assets under management and that's because a lot of people are attracted to its dividend yield of seven and a half percent and basically that fund strategy is to buy low volatility stocks and then sell covered calls as a way to boost up the yield and that's been working fantastic this last half year some are saying these funds are helping to compress vix and keep it low which could be partially true have a low vix is more the result of this parabolic price action we've got now which is actually reminding me of the second half of 2017, we had similar price action. Just looking at it here. This is September, October 2017. It broke out and then we started going parabolic to the point that it rode up really hard and then it came off really hard as well in kind of a two week flash crash. That wasn't too bad in the S&P 500 itself. Didn't fall that much, recovered kind of quickly. However, the effect was much more pronounced in the VIX. It too got really low back then. It was actually under 10 and it just shot up just over a week, getting over 50. And that period in February 2018 is what they call Volmageddon. A lot of people were short volatility, new ETFs on the market, some of which blew up, a few hedge funds blew up, and a lot of people 
people, and a lot of people thought they had found Nirvana by shorting volatility this whole time. They also blew up as well. So we could be heading towards a similar scenario. Just looking at VIX now, we've been pretty much trading under 15 since late November. And this market could easily go into a strong ascent. And then if you see the VIX starting to rise while the market's still rising, that's option dealers getting prepared for a flash crash. And sometimes a market like this has to kind of go into a blow off top for it to resolve. Everyone's just piling on. Moving on to the most entertaining topic of financial markets. These days is Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Hold it in there. Actually looking pretty good technically. Just kind of consolidating above $70,000 a coin. This market still has trend and momentum in it. Wouldn't be surprised if we break out again next week. However, the big news today was the former crypto king himself, Sam Bankman-Fried, getting sentenced to a quarter century in the slammer, and his day of reckoning has arrived. Found guilty on seven charges of fraud and conspiracy, including money laundering, and the guy's delusional. Even the current CEO of the crypto exchange company he founded, FTX, blasts SBF for claiming fraud victims will not suffer, based on his claim that customers, lenders, and investors were not harmed by his fraud, and even said himself he's living a life of delusion. And so it's just funny to see the former crypto king's Sam Bankman-Fried is on the cover of Fortune and Forbes magazine. Did a really good job of convincing everybody. He's this minimalist, doesn't care about money, just wants to make the world a better place. When really, he was living two lives. One he presented to the public, and a debaucherous one, full of material indulgences behind the scene. Not only that, he was friends with a lot of politicians. He was a big donor to them as well. And so it's kind of funny to see SBF and the second largest previous leader in crypto, the world's biggest exchange, Binance. Chang Peng Zhao, CZ. He also got taken out as well. Company slapped with a $4 billion fine. He pled guilty to money laundering. Him himself had to pay $50 million fine. And just like SBF, he was also on the front of these big magazine covers and held up on a mantle for being the leaders of the new finance. And so it's a bit funny, isn't it? These two guys, the two previous crypto kings taken down and then all of a sudden wall street steps in and is now approved to offer crypto etfs it's funny how that works isn't it and don't get me wrong sbf and chang pang zhao are guilty just like most people in the industry a lot of them are dodgy frauds looking for shortcuts and cheats and cz as well owning the world's largest crypto exchange wasn't enough he was also doing a little house trading on the side trading against his own clients from 300 accounts so they both deserve everything they've got and i guess that was wall street's opportunity to take crypto out of these guys' hands and put it into their own. Of which has been massively successful for them right out the gate. Already getting past 100 billion in assets under management, breaking records on the way. And remember, Wall Street makes money regardless. Wherever Bitcoin ends up, they collect fees on assets under management. Nothing to do with performance. And so it's no surprise we've got the CEO of the largest one, the iShares Bitcoin Trust, iBit from BlackRock. That's Larry Fink, who says he's now very bullish on the long-term viability of Bitcoin. I'm sure he is. And so the waters in crypto are still muddied. Saw that again today with the US and UK reportedly looking into a $20 billion crypto payments that may have helped Moscow evade sanctions. It's no surprise there, as that's where most of its utility comes from, is invading sanctions, money laundering, drug dealing, extortion, ransomware, so on and so forth. You could kind of think of it as the currency of the underworld, but all that doesn't matter because it's crypto sum. We've even got meme coins like Dogecoin surging 18%, getting to a $31 billion valuation, bigger than Deutsche Bank. And other meme coins like this one here, Elizabeth Horan, which had been on a tear earlier this month. And that's named after the famous politician, Elizabeth Warren. And so who knows, maybe this could be the currency of the future. Or maybe it'll be this coin here, Dog With Hat, which has been on an absolute tear this year, now with a market cap of $3.8 billion. And let's not forget the coin Geo Bowden, who's also having a really good month. And now we've got some short sellers coming after MicroStrategy, outlining the same trade I gave to you guys a week ago. That's long Bitcoin, short MicroStrategy. And that's Kerasdale Capital, who I agree with, is saying MicroStrategy trades at an unjustifiable premium over the crypto itself. With their analysis pointing to the market value in MicroStrategy as if Bitcoin was trading for $177,000 per Bitcoin. At Bitcoin's current price of above $70,000, MicroStrategy's crypto holdings are worth $15 billion. But the company has an enterprise value of $38 billion, more than double the value of its Bitcoin holding. And they value their underlying software business at $1.3 billion, which I agree with as well. However, it's because of this guy here. He keeps borrowing low interest rate debt to buy Bitcoin. And if he has his way, he's going to keep doing that as much as possible. So his company MicroStrategy already owns 1% of all Bitcoins. And if he keeps doing that strategy, who knows, can he own 2% of Bitcoin, 5%, 10%? Can he corner the market to himself and he'll soon be the richest man in the world? Either way, it's really interesting to watch 
and report on. As even though it's only got 35 billion market cap, pretty small relative to all the other bigger guys who are hundreds of billions, if not trillions, it's constantly near the top of the volume leaders list. We can see that today. The sixth most traded stock after Microsoft, $7.7 billion of shares changing hands, and even more crazy in the options market. Coming in fourth again today for the amount of notional call options traded. And so even though Bitcoin held up today, so did Coinbase finishing the day higher. The market took note of that report from Kerastale Capital. Actually sold off a bit here today, down 11% on huge volume. Still too early to say whether this is a top. And this is the trade I showed you guys a week ago that Kerastale Capital also mentioned today. Long Bitcoin in the form of the BlackRock Trust short micro strategy. A highly risky trade, always best a dollar cost average with small positions. Now if Bitcoin were to have a correction, micro strategy is likely to correct a lot harder than the underlying Bitcoin. And this spread could easily go up 50, 70, 100% in no time at all. And there's a look at some other spreads I've been watching and shared with you guys. Doing well again today. It's long General Motors, short Tesla, long Nvidia, short SMCI, and long value, short growth, starting to wake up here a little bit as well. Moving on to economic data we got today. There's the GDP growth rate, quarter over quarter, 3.4%, and consumer sentiment coming in a bit hotter than expected. Core PCE index, tomorrow expected to grow 2.8% year over year. And Fed fund futures, currently about a 64% chance we're going to cut in June. Greed index still at 71, and corporate insiders going on Easter holiday, not doing much trading at all. And just a few charts before we wrap it up here today. Got the dividend factor outperforming again, trading higher, close to going back into trend mode. Well, we've got a little bit of softness and growth and momentum consolidating somewhat. My top 10 ETF picks this year overall had a good day. And at the end of Q1 as a portfolio, they're up 6%, not including dividends. So not doing too bad, considering about half the portfolio is outside the US as well. With the number one pick, MSOS, looking for big things out of this next week, hoping we get that rescheduling from the DEA, which could light this sector up even more. There's Apple still looking a little soft here. Microsoft just pulling back from all-time high. And Meta actually lost its 50-day VWAP for the first time since back in late October. That's been one of the best performing stocks over the last year. And Tesla still struggling to reclaim its 50-day VWAP. And we've got these hot stocks, DJT, Astera Labs, and Reddit continuing to trade down after hours as I speak. And mixed results from these other hot stocks we're watching as well. With a good day for Walgreens Boots on the back of their better than expected earnings, looking to defend the support zone there. And JP Morgan sitting at all-time highs, $200 a share. All right, guys, there we have it for this short and trading week. Pretty much the same thing we've been getting for months now, just grinding higher. A bit more exuberance underneath the hood, looking at these meme stocks this week. And come back to the channel tomorrow. I'm going to do a special video. Even though the market's shut, I've got some interesting things I want to share with you guys. Other than that, thanks very much for tuning in. And if you're interested in getting all my 25 custom indicators, then click the link below this video. Head on over to my website, clickcapital.io, and take advantage of my Easter special before it runs out. Because like I said, it'll be a while before I offer these indicators on sale again. That's all for now. I'll see you guys again tomorrow. Cheers.